Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 51 of the Summit for Wellness podcast. I'm your host, Brian Carroll, and today's episode is brought to you by Hana One, which is an Ayurvedic herbal blend that helps your body to adapt to stress, improve its immune system, and be able to mitigate some of the radiation that we receive on a daily basis, which are all key aspects that we actually talk about in this episode that you are listening to right now. Hana One has a really nice blend of adaptogenic herbs, which is fantastic to help reduce stress levels at the cellular level, which in the end helps to improve your HPA access, which we discuss in this episode. So if you want to learn more about Hana One, go to summitforwellness.com slash H-A-N-A-H. Okay. In this episode, I brought on Cynthia Thurlow, who is a nurse practitioner and also a functional nutritionist who focuses her practice on women with hormonal health issues such as weight gain issues, insomnia, food cravings, and a lack of energy. So I brought her on to talk all about how to regulate the endocrine system and to help women to gain control of their hormones to be able to feel the best that they can feel. So let's dive right into my episode with Cynthia Thurlow. Cynthia Thurlow is a Western medicine trained nurse practitioner with a solid 20 years of experience in emergency and cardiovascular medicine, turned functional nutritionist and female hormonal health expert and thought leader. She lives in the Washington, D.C. Sub- suburbs with her husband, two boys, and two crazy doodles. She's pas- passionate about helping women support hormonal health in their childbearing years and beyond. Thank you, Cynthia, for coming on to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Cynthia, before we start diving into uh, hormonal health, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you into the medical industry? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in undergrad, I was pre-law and got into law school. I was a poli-sci major. And it's it's funny, um, my parents made it very clear that when I finished undergrad that any other education I did was totally on my own. And I got into law school and thought really long and hard about being becoming an attorney. And I started looking at what the starting salaries were for attorneys. And I started looking at how much debt I was going to be in going to a private law school. And all of a sudden, I didn't really want to do it. And I think it was, you know, it was one of those goals I'd achieved, you know, it was that gold star, you know, I I attained getting into law school, but I didn't really want to be an attorney. So I went and worked for two years for a Fortune 500 company, which I hated. And then I got a dog. And as crazy as this sounds, getting a dog completely changed my whole focus in my life. And suddenly I became very interested in, um, you know, going back to school. And initially I thought med school and then you know, with so many people in my family that are already in the medical field, um, a, my older cousin, who's a physician, actually said, why don't you become a nurse practitioner? And so down that rabbit hole, I went and took pre-med classes and then did a, a program um, at a private university in Maryland where I got a second bachelor's and then a master's. And, and as soon as I started taking classes and, you know, being in a big teaching hospital, it was kind of like every geeky vibe in my body was just lit up. Like I was with my people. <laughs> I was with the people that kind of got me and understood me. And I and I loved being of service to others. And so, um, you know, I, I existed in that world for a long time, for a long, long time. And then, gosh, probably I've, I've been a parent for almost 13 years. Um, my oldest, uh, 11, 12 years ago, had terrible eczema and you know that the typical western medicine way of addressing skin issues is to suppress whatever inflammation they're witnessing and so in that case it was steroids and i kept saying to the pediatrician is it something i'm eating because he was breastfeeding and they kept saying no no i'm sure everything's fine even though i ate pretty healthy or healthy ish um at that time and so long story short he had terrible debilitating life-threatening food allergies and that started the whole process of looking at food and nutrition very very differently and you know working in western medicine there's not a lot of focus on food uh, and there's certainly not a lot of um, 
regard for food. You know, you just eat what's given to you and, and that's that. And there's no correlation with gut health and, and the food that you're eating and how that can impact your health. And so what started happening for me was my own transformation and helping to heal my son was starting to change my whole mindset. And so initially um, I thought, okay, I'm, I've been doing, I've been an MP for a long time. I thought I wanted to be a wellness coach. And so I did that. No, that didn't fit right. And then I started a PhD program and I didn't really love that. And then I kind of stumbled upon um, Nutritional Therapy Association. There was a blogger that I followed and I reached out to her because I liked her message. I liked the fact that she talked about whole foods. I liked that she talked about healthy fats. I mean, that kind of resonated with me. And so when I finally got connected with her and she told me about the program, I think I signed up within a month. Um, and my, my, actually my practice, I worked for a large cardiology practice. They give us a certain amount of continuing ed every year. Uh, they actually paid for um, my program. And so I got my NTC certification and that's when my whole life kind of opened up. I mean, it changed everything um, and really, really um, kind of shook at the core of my Western medicine training and really had me thinking about where, what direction my life would go in from that point. So uh, when you went through the NTC program, mm -hmm. did you know that you were going to be leaving your job at the hospital right after taking that program? Or was it a slow transition out of there to start um, your practice that you run now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I was, I was doing that program and I was working as a nurse practitioner for this private practice cardiology group. So I was in the hospital and in clinic. Um, and it wasn't until, gosh, it was three years ago. So it was 2015 and we bought a house and sold a house. Um, I was finishing up the program. You know, my kids were still, gosh, they were, you know, rising, you know, they were in second and, and kindergarten. So really young. Um, so still pretty demanding uh, in terms of time. And I just started getting physically very tired. Um, and I knew something was wrong because I'm a very kind of energetic person. I exercise a lot. I've always been very fit. And, you know, I, I recall I got out of bed one day after we moved into our new house. And I was like, God, I, I had no energy. I knew something was wrong. Uh, I had an idea of what was wrong, but I didn't want, really want to admit it to myself. And so um, I worked with my mentor uh, at the time and, and kind of did a deep dive into what was going on with me hormonally. And it was very humbling. And it became very apparent to me that I wasn't going to get better. I wasn't going to be able to fix what was wrong until I reduced my stress substantially. And that's a hard thing to wrap your head around because let's be honest, um, my background's in ER medicine and cardiology. I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. I like sick people. I like the rigor of critically sick people. Uh, and to acknowledge that um, I needed to kind of get my, I needed to kind of get my, um, you know, my stimulation in different ways, you know, intellectually was it was really hard to wrap my head around. But a very good friend of mine who is probably my favorite physician I've ever worked with looked at me, who he has a very deep faith, and he said, Cynthia, when you let go of your ego, the decision will be easy. And I, I mean, I still to this day, it gets tears in my eyes when I think about it. But he said that to me and it, it just, it, everything became clear. What's most important? Because if I'm hanging on to this job because of my ego, because of course my parents thought I was crazy, you know, why would you, you know, you're, you went to a very, very good university. Um, you've got this really, really good job. Why, how could you step away from that? I mean, and because my parents have big egos, that's why they kind of struggle with that. Um, but, you know, it, it, really recognizing that I wasn't going to be the kind of parent that my children deserve, the kind of wife that my husband deserved to have, to be the kind of person who could really give of themselves to others um, meant that I had to take a step back. And so that decision, once I made it, was an easy one, but getting to that point was very hard. And so um, that became the, the next rabbit hole of, you know, diving into fixing, healing myself. And then when I was able to heal myself, the irony is that out of that came uh, the development of a niche so I can actually help women when they're going through the same health issues because I've been there. You know, I always tell people it's a whole lot easier when you haven't been through it yourself. When you've been there and someone says to you, I'm so tired, I can't function. You know, I've gained weight and I've never had a problem with my weight or I have crazy food cravings and I've never had this before. What does this mean? I get it because I've been there and I come back. Like now I'm on the other side. So I can, you know, I can say enthusiastically 
that it makes such a huge difference when you've got someone that can kind of guide you and help you make sense of what may not be what, what may not be as clear to other um, healthcare providers of what's going on. And that's such a good niche to go into too, because there's mm-hmm. so many women out there that are suffering from these hormonal issues and mm-hmm. weight gain issues and insomnia and food cravings and all sorts of stuff. So why is it that there's so many women that suffer from these different issues? I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, there's so many things. I mean, if you think about the fact that if our endocrine system is really um, controlled ultimately by the HPA axis, so hypothalamus pituitary axis. So, you know, our brain, if we aren't taking care of our brain, our brain's going to make sure it lets us know that we need to take care of ourselves. And so I think part of the problem is we're in a very overstimulated world. We feel compelled to be connected to technology. I know we were touching base on, about that specifically right before we got on our call. But I think the 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 influences of what goes on in the environment, um, you know, feeling like we have to be connected to technology 24-7, the amount of stress we experience, people who don't prioritize sleep, um, not eating the right foods for our bodies. And this is not a this is not a, a criticism. It's just that we are in a society where we believe that, you know, meals aren't meant to be savored. They're meant to be rushed and we should be eating in our cars or eating at our kids game or eating on the go um, and not, you know, really putting our bodies into the right mindset to actually consume let alone digest food. I think that it really stems from our um, lifestyle choices. And so I think when you're in your 20s and 30s, your body can better handle and weather us not taking care of ourselves. However, as we get older, um, and I have clients in their 20s and 30s, so by no estimation is this just an issue of people over the age of 40, but I think as we get older, our bodies are less capable of making the adjustments that need to happen in order to ensure that we can weather those kinds of stressors. I'll give you an example. I live in Northern Virginia, and interestingly enough, there are a lot of data centers in our area, and I'm starting to notice a lot of women who are having trouble sleeping because obviously the exposure to radiation. And I know that the Board of Supervisors in our in our area probably think it's wonderful because it helps with the tax base, but by the same token, you start to wonder how all of these things influence the endocrine system, our brains, our ability to de-stress, um, you know, that whole ancestral living that, you know, one of our colleagues, Brian Hoyer, really talks about um, has really resonated with me deeply. So to, you know, kind of touch base on your your original question, I suspect a lot of the reasons why we're starting to see these health issues is just because of the way that we live our lives. This, these are not issues that people had 100 years ago. When you think about it, it really is a, you know, modern day epidemic. And I think many, many people are so disconnected from their bodies that they don't register these kinds of changes uh, until it's too late or until they're at a point where they're really sick. And earlier you mentioned that a lot of people think this is something that happens in your 40s or later. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that it it's happening to people that are younger and younger. Have you Mm -hmm. seen that? it's starting to happen earlier on in people's lives now because we are so much more connected to technology and there's uh, way more stressors in our daily lives now. I do. And, and I think, you know, the other piece of that is, you know, when I talk about environmental stress, there's also physical stress that people experience. You know, we've got a culture that highly values how thin women are. Um, and I'm going to focus on women primarily, but women who feel compelled and they see, they see these highly, Um, sexualized, um, augmented, um, photoshopped images on social media that they assume these people look like this, you know, that they really in actuality look like their photos. And so there's all this pressure on young women, uh, whether they're young mothers or they're not yet mothers. And so, yes, I see a lot of women who overexercise and don't eat enough good quality food. So the 20 and 30 somethings that I'm starting to see these same endocrine issues are the ones that are that are really overdoing it. Um, I think by the time most people hit 40, they're probably not doing um, super intense exercise all the time that people can kind of weather a bit better when they're younger. But I can think of one 20 something who was following, you know, one of the big fitness 
bloggers who's out there who's very, very successful, has a seven figure business. Um, I, I've gotten lots of clients from this, um, from this program. Um, and I can almost guess before they even tell me what their symptoms are, what's going on. Uh, and, and, you know, explaining to them that, no, you can't be intermittent fasting. You um, need to be eating more carbohydrates in your diet. You need to stop exercising so intensely because it was, it's really putting such a tremendous and profound drain on their bodies. Um, I've got 30 some things in the same boat. And so, you know, we're really doing ourselves a disservice by kind of creating these unrealistic, um, you know, societal standards for all, that a lot of women ascribe to, and myself included. I'm, I'm certainly not perfect, um, but I'm also at a different stage in my life, and I'm not quite as influenced by what I see on social media about what is normal. You know, you see these, you know, so, you know, I don't celebutants that um, are in social media who, you know, they have a baby and two days later they've lost all the weight or something ridiculous. And I'm like, normal people can't do that. I mean, that's not realistic. And so I think there's also that societal pressure that people put on themselves to ascribe to a certain, you know, ideal in their minds that can be uh, profoundly detrimental because the the inner dialogue we have with ourselves can be equally destructive, right? Um, yeah, I know that you're a guy, but um, a lot of what I hear from my female clients is that inner dialogue for them can really be profoundly uh, damaging um, and profoundly so. Yeah, I have a lot of female friends and they have said very similar things that mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of times they live in their heads and everything that they're influenced by is up in their head and that influences their decisions and what's going on in their minds. So mm -hmm. I can definitely see how that plays a role there. Uh, let's dive into the HPA access a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, can you tell us what it is and how stress impacts the way the HPA access functions and what that does to the body? Absolutely. So when we talk about the hypothalamus pituitary axis, what we're really talking about is the brain. So hypothalamus pituitary are in the brain and they orchestrate communication with all of the endocrine organs um, and glands. So things like your thyroid, your adrenal glands, um, your sex hormones, those are the, some of the more common ones, but they also impact um, secretion of melatonin from the penile gland in the brain. Um, they impact, um, you know, so many of the organs in our bodies. And so when you know we're talking about um, the net impact on um, our health and and wellness um, it's really really important that like i was mentioning that inner dialogue so so important that we're dialing in on stress you know our body our brains specifically are very very sensitive to the stimuli that is around us and that is within us so when i talk to clients about things like restorative therapies like i want them out you know now it's nice and warm in northern virginia so they can they can do grounding work they can get in the grass but getting outside so that you know their bodies can kind of you know um, get a sense of circadian rhythm patterns you know we're supposed to be awake when it's light outside we're supposed to be asleep when it's dark outside you know recognizing that our bodies need to be in this parasympathetic mode um, at, at points throughout the day and, and worth tying into this is that our central nervous system um, has two kind of key areas that we, or realms that we work in you know sympathetic um, is you know we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger but in our overstimulated environment where many people are sympathetic dominant everything's revved up and when you're revved up you're not going to digest food you're not going to be able to go to the bathroom you're not going to have sex because you might be chased by a wild animal whereas when you're in parasympathetic mode you're you're relaxed your body can digest your brain is is able to kind of process uh, a whole lot better the information that's around surrounding you so when I talk to clients about the influence of these two separate kind of parts of our central nervous system that work in conjunction with the HPA access, it's really imperative that we tap into that, you know, kind of rest and repose part of our brain so that we can actually digest our food. You know, when I do talks in the community and I talk to kids about where does digestion start, kids always say your mouth. Okay, that's a good place to think. I said it actually starts in your brain. So literally you have to be in the right frame of mind to be able to digest food and what are most people doing they're driving around their cars while they're eating they're talking they're distracted by social media um, so this very delicate you know circuitry in our brain really governs how we perceive the world how we interact with the world how we um, how we love how we learn how we digest food I mean there's so many things that are impacted by this and it's really really essential that we, we nourish this part of our bodies and so even as a Western medicine trained provider, I mean, obviously I had plenty, plenty of, um, 
you know, lectures on uh, the nervous system and the endocrine system over the years, but, you know, kind of making those ties in about brain health and how it impacts how we perceive the world and how healthy we are. Um, that to me is really at the forefront and, and almost supersedes in many ways, other things that I really focus on with clients. So when you see people that have uh, dysfunction in their HPA access, what are mm -hmm. some strategies that you use to help to improve the functioning of the HPA access? Yeah, so it's a good question. So um, first, we always focus on sleep. Sleep is absolutely imperative. Um, if you're not sleeping well, you know, the bulk of your, of your and this is, seems, seems completely counterintuitive, but when we sleep, that's when our, you know, our brain really is on repair. It's more active then than at any other time during the day, which seems, again, very counterintuitive. So sleep is paramount. Quality of sleep is paramount. Ensuring that you've got REM sleep, which is such a small portion of the amount of hours that you're sleeping every night, super, super imperative. So you have to sleep to be able to control your food cravings. You have to sleep to be able to um, impact weight gain issues. You have to sleep to have energy. And so we start there. Um, and then it's really tapping into things that will facilitate, um, you know, um, either having a hobby, something that brings someone joy. You know, there, there are a lot of people, Brian, that um, if you ask them, what do they do for joy? They can't come up with an answer. And it's because they're on, they're in, they're almost like an automatron. You know, they, they recognize they have to do X, Y, Z from Monday through Friday. They have to take care of their kids. They got to cook dinner for their family. They have to, you know, take their dog for a walk and then they worry about themselves last. So I always explain that self-care is absolutely important. So finding something that they love, that, that they want to nurture, cultivate, or enjoy, uh, super important. That could be something as benign as reading a book every week or, um, you know, taking a hot bath with, you know, magnesium salts or, um, you know, just doing a hobby that you enjoy and then being really connected to nature. I mean, these are all very simple things that anyone can do, but are super, super imperative. And I, I know you're out on the West Coast, but I know for us East Coasters, we have four seasons. And what happens for a lot of people here is that from November through March, it's cold, it's wet, it's rainy, sometimes it's snowy, people don't want to be outside. And it really negatively impacts their mood and um, it impacts their sleep patterns as well. So um, those are some very easy things that you can do to support the HP access that anyone can do. You know, this is, these are not extraneous, crazy things that I put out there. The other thing that I would really recommend people consider doing is limiting their social media slash electronic use in the evening, or if they need to be on electronics for business, or if they're watching TV with their family, um, you know, wearing blue blocking um, glasses. And, and so we know that a lot of our electronics emanate a blue light, which will disrupt secretion of melatonin. And most people have heard of that hormone. And melatonin is the hormone that's secreted by the penile gland in the brain, but you know, kind of tells our body that we're, we're kind of getting ready towards bed and, and it's time to go to bed. But what happens is that blue light from electronics will disrupt the secretion of that hormone. And so that's when people get the wired and tired. You know, they're awake at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. They're on their iPad in bed. They're watching TV in bed. They're, you know, doing something that, or they're on their computers and really can be profoundly disruptive. So I would encourage everyone, they're like $10. The brand is Uvex. They're on Amazon. They're $10. You can wear them. They're very sexy. Um, and I say that kiddingly. Um, you kind of look like a big bug, but really super helpful. And so that, again, can kind of feed into... Um, you know, limiting our time on electronics or wearing the UVX blockers after six o'clock at night uh, really makes a big, big difference. And question in there, uh, using something like Flux or even the built-in uh, blue light blocking systems on phones now, does that do the same thing or do the glasses do a better job? I'm told, um, I haven't looked at any study data, but I'm told that it's more beneficial to actually wear the blockers. I know for myself personally, I'm super, super sensitive to the blue light. And when I started wearing the blockers and just, you know, putting things on, um, you know, that, that nighttime mode didn't make a bit of difference. If I put the, the electronics on that nighttime mode, when I wear the blockers makes a huge difference. I can't even watch TV with my kids at night without them on because I'm wondering why I'm wide awake at midnight. And it's because of that, you know, disruption. And the other piece is when you think about the fact, if you blunt the secretion of melatonin in the brain, what it does is it tells your adrenals, okay, let's bump up some cortisol. We're going to stay up for a while. And that further, you start the same circuitous issue 
um, where people really struggle to get in bed. And we know cortisol levels should be lowest in the evening. That's, you know, following that diurnal pattern that, that occurs throughout the day. So when that gets disrupted, that further exacerbates that endocrine system. So everything goes back to the endocrine system. It's so poorly, um, so poorly appreciated on so many levels, but so, so important. Uh, when you put on the blue uh, light blocking glasses, do you do it at a certain point at the night or during the night, like a couple hours before bed, or do you follow the clock of the sun? So like when the sun's setting, do you start wearing them or how do you do that? Yeah, great question. For me personally, I usually say six o'clock. Um, realistically, um, because my, my face is so narrow, you know, the blue blockers I have, I have to keep pushing them back up on my nose. So it's probably closer to seven ish. If I'm, if I know I'm going to be on the computer, usually seven o'clock is when I start wearing them. Um, that's, that's typically what I do. That works a whole lot better. Awesome. Now, you've been talking a lot about getting sleep. And then you also mentioned earlier how you live in an area that has all these data centers and people mm -hmm. are um, suffering from insomnia with that. Over here on the West Coast, and I'm not sure about the what the rest of the country, there's a lot of um, cities that are starting to install the the 5G cell towers. Yeah. So a lot of frequencies going out. What can yeah. people do to reduce the exposure to frequencies um, so that they're able to sleep better? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I can speak to you personally because we had our house evaluated last year. So there are a number of things that people can do. Um, you know, obviously getting your home tested is helpful, but if you can't do that, turning off Wi-Fi at night, super, super important. I have a husband who we, we, we have, um, I have a spouse who needs to be like Uber connected all the time. So our Wi-Fi, we've, we've even got a booster in our house, which I'm embarrassed to admit that, but he needs that for work. So uh, we turn off the Wi-Fi at night. That's a number one that absolutely reduces things. Getting rid of your microwave um, can be profoundly beneficial. I know there are probably people crying all over the place hearing me say that. <laughs> um, you know, getting your electronics out of the bedroom or if you have them in your bedroom, putting them on airplane mode. Um, there are grounding mats that you can purchase to go underneath your beds. So if you think about how radiation kind of comes down the walls underneath the floor and comes up into the bed, uh, making sure that you have a non-metal mattress. Um, if it's really problematic, I know there are specialized um, uh, paints that you can use that can block radiation as well as specialized drapes. I have not gone that route yet, uh, but we've done all of the other things that I have mentioned. And they've been, they've made a huge net impact. I mean, my older son and I are much more sensitive to radiation uh, frequencies than my, my husband and my other son. And so, um, you know, making these changes has made a profound difference. Like the quality of my sleep from December until now is profoundly different. And, you know, and interestingly enough, the other thing that we bought was a, um, a real salt lamp. So one that's from harvested from Pakistan. And so that sits in our great room which is the, the downstairs, obviously our first floor is where we spend the bulk of our time. But by doing that and all the other things I've mentioned have made such a profound difference. Um, you know, for me personally, we, this is our second home we've owned in this neighborhood. The other house, I never had problems sleeping this house since we moved in. And when, when it was evaluated last summer, it was very apparent why um, the sleep patterns were so disrupted. You know, same, same town, same neighborhood, different house. Um, all these variables that, you know, impacted our two out of four of us, our ability to sleep well. And so those are, most of those things are things people can do, right? You know, they can do within their budget and within a time frame. The irony is that when we evaluated our mattresses, um, everyone's mattresses were okay, except the organic mattress that we had bought my younger son right when we moved in had coils in it. And so it was one of the first things that Brian Hoyer mentioned. He said, you need to replace this mattress. And I, of course, was completely stunned um because i thought you know it's an organic mattress it has to be perfect nope <laughs> it wasn't so just the things that you learn you know as you kind of go navigate these changes for yourself as well yeah we had brian hoyer on i forget how many episodes ago but yeah a lot of the stuff he was talking about with all the emf exposure mm -hmm. just it's stuff i had no idea and now it's it's definitely made a difference in how we sleep and how we feel um, inside of our household too. So it's definitely, uh, I never realized how much of an impact it had. Uh, but what are some other strategies um, to help improve the functioning of the HPA access? Yeah, I mean, there are things that I like, you know, adaptogenic herbs can be very helpful. 
you know, depending on what someone needs, um, you know, there are products um, that people can buy. I mean, I like ashwagandha. I like rhodiola. Really depends on what someone's symptoms are. You know, are they dealing with energy issues or is it anxiety? Um, I really like a product called Serifos. And so this is phosphatidylserine. And what I like about it is that we know it has a positive net impact on cortisol. We know that, you know, our brain is mostly made of fat. And so it's very, very supportive of the HPA access. And it's actually, I jokingly say, and so let me, let me backtrack. When I worked as a nurse practitioner in cardiology, the ongoing joke was we needed to have statins. So things like Zocor and Lipitor in the water because everyone needed them. That was, that was our mindset. Now I jokingly say everyone needs Serifos because every person who starts taking this has such a profound beneficial impact on their sleep quality that I always say, if there's, if there's one supplement I will take for the rest of my life, it is this one. And so we know that it's profoundly nourishing for the brain, um, can be profoundly nourishing for that HPA access along with the adaptogenic herbs. Obviously, some adaptogens you want to take in the morning and not in the afternoon. Um, those are probably the two big ones that I like most um, pretty consistently. And so adaptogenic herbs, you can drink tea like holy basil tea. Um, you can take, you know, plain ashwagandha. I will preface this by saying that ashwagandha doesn't always taste all that great. Uh, so sometimes people have to mix it into smoothies uh, or, or mix it. I have a, a friend who's an herbalist and an acupuncturist, and she rolls truffles and things in, in ashwagandha powder, which I always find absolutely fascinating. But those are two good ways that they can absolutely um, integrate that into their, their life pretty easily. Yeah, the rolling in the ashwagandha powder, I think that's an Ayurvedic mm -hmm. um, technique, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so. no, my, my acupuncturist is always trying to give me things that she's she's making. And, it, and it's fascinating because I said I never would have thought to roll, you know, roll like a little protein ball into that. Uh, but it works well. And, and it actually was tasty. I told her, I said, it did, if I put ashwagandha powder into a smoothie, I, I can always tell. It's almost a little bit bitter. Um, and it has nothing to do with the, if I give half a teaspoon or a teaspoon, it's just bitter. So it's not dose dependent. Yeah. A lot of those herbs are extremely bitter and, um, that's why people either do a, a tincture or, uh, they do a capsule because then they don't have to taste it. But I definitely find, um, if you look at traditional roots on taking herbs, using teas and uh, infusions and stuff like that get into the system a lot better but mm -hmm. like you said it doesn't taste that great so. yeah that, that can definitely be and there are things like shaman shack makes some really great um adaptogen you know uh combinations another one is moon juice you know there are a lot of they call them their dusts um and so i like those you know they have some that have things like maca which for women is is profoundly nourishing that's actually a tuber it's not technically an adaptogen but um, a really good option for women to take in the first half of their menstrual cycle. Um, but, you know, there's some data to suggest it can also be helpful. And, and for a lot of the women I work with, they have libido issues, but that can be helpful for that as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of stacking. I use the term stacking, you know, putting different ingredients into a smoothie or something that I'm eating, because I agree with you that um, if we make it as bioavailable as possible, our bodies will be able to assimilate it a whole lot more easily. So when you were working with women and uh, trying to create this hormonal uh, protocol for them, is there a specific type of diet that you try to utilize um, with most people or is it very individual based? Um, well, most women that work with me have the, the um, financial ability to be able to do food sensitivity testing. So it's always customized. Um, I just feel that um, you know, general elimination diets, oftentimes people are consuming exactly the foods that are inflaming their body. So I'll give myself an example. I'm in the midst of an elimination, a personalized elimination diet because I came back from Barcelona with more than just good memories. Um, I picked up a couple <laughs> of parasites, I think, from all the pork I ate, which is a whole other topic of conversation. But the point of why I'm sharing it is um, I had been hanging on to about five pounds um, since I got sick five years ago and, and or three years ago. And everyone kept saying, oh, well, you're a certain age. You know, you should just accept this, including my husband. Do you know that as soon as I started that elimination diet, I lost the rest of the weight? And so the woman that I'm working with, who's a peer of ours, 
she said, it just goes to show you, you can eat something healthy and it's inflaming your body. And so I probably will have to eliminate those foods for the rest of my existence, which I accept um, because I feel so much better. The point being is that general elimination diets are fine, but there may still be underlying food sensitivities that you're unaware of until you do the testing. And so for me, it's always a triad. We almost always do either dry urine testing um, or saliva-based testing to look at adrenals, um, almost always do stool-based testing to look at inflammation and potential pathogens, and then also the food sensitivity. So for me, it's always at least those three studies that can be really profoundly beneficial, at really honing in on what might be going on with each individual client. And then is there a generalized framework for like macronutrients that you're looking for with these people as well once you figure out what food sensitivities that they have or is that also pretty individualized? Um, it can be. I mean, I, I, I would probably say I am not someone, at least for my clients, that is that is pushing the, a, a ketogenic diet, although I know there's a, a tremendous amount of value for very specific reasons for other um, clients and peers. I tend to like um, people to have primarily um, plant-based diet with with some animal protein, healthy fats, and then you know if they bring in starchy vegetables or starchy carbs, that that's really not the focus of their diet. I don't like people to go low carb. I think low carb can be profoundly detrimental to not only adrenal but also thyroid health. And so you know a lot of it can be some people if they've been doing hardcore paleo for a long time, and I start telling them to sneak in sweet potato and rice. Sometimes that can put them into, you know, a state of apoplexy. So sometimes it can be cycling carbohydrates. I've gotten very savvy with that, with intermittent fasting for people that it's appropriate for. So to answer your question, you know, macros are, are oftentimes very largely dependent on the person. You know, not everyone um, digests fats well. Some people digest protein better than others. So there's more testing to kind of look at to help guide that. But I always let hunger be a guide. You know, I have some women that can eat a whole avocado a day. I have some people who can eat a quarter of an avocado a day. Um, and so it's, it's really tinkering with each person to find out what works best for them. So diving into the HPA axis a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, we know that a lot of times if there's dysfunction there, then there's probably dysfunction in the digestive system mm -hmm. somewhere. So to get people to receive the actual nutrients from the foods that you're uh, helping them to eat, how are you then getting their digestive system to actually break down the food properly so that mm -hmm. they can receive those nutrients? Great question. Um, well, first and foremost, they have to be in the right frame of mind. You know, they can't be eating in their car and running around and eating as they're standing up and feeding their kids. So you have to be able to um, be in that rest and repose mindset, you know, whether it's they take three deep, deep breaths before they eat a meal. Um, we have to know that they're breaking their food down. So most people, by the time they hit the age of 40, they don't make enough hydrochloric acid. So if they need that supplementation or something like zinc carnosine to ensure that they're starting to break down that first step in protein um, digestion, super, super important. You know, do they digest their fats? Do they need, um, you know, gallbladder and, and biliary support? Do they need digestive enzymes? Those are all the things that I really tinker with. Um, you know, there's one test in particular that I use that is profoundly helpful in helping to determine if they're breaking their fats down, for example. And you know, if they have high fecal fat count in their in their stool, you know they're not breaking their fats down. So then you have to kind of dial back and go, okay, how much more support does their gallbladder you know need so that they can properly break these fats down? And that's usually a, that's that's usually the big focus. And then we kind of dial in from there. You know, for a lot of people, there's so many emotional issues surrounding food. You know, some of us think of food as fuel, and that's how I think of food. For many, many other people, um, many of my clients, they struggle with the the um, the emotional aspects of eating. And so, you know, for many people, when you start telling them they either need to clean up what they're eating, they need to change what they're eating, or their comfort foods, um, it can sometimes be a little bit of a power struggle for them because they recognize they want the help. Uh, but they're not always willing to make those changes. And so the other piece about digesting your food is making sure that they are they are cognizant of how eating the right foods um, can make a huge difference in how well they digest them. So th those are like key kind of big takeaway, big points that I talk to all my clients about. I'm sure you probably do as well. Right, for sure. Is there anything else that you want to uh, talk about in uh ways for people to improve their overall endocrine function and to get people, especially women, to be able to reach their weight gain um, numbers that they want to be at to improve their sleep and reduce their food cravings? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say it really has to be recognizing it's a journey, not a race, because many, many women come to me and they'll say things like, I have 20 pounds to lose, and that's what they're focused on. But really, weight gain is a reflection of something else, whether it's latent inflammation, whether it's an imbalance in their thyroid, whether it's an imbalance in the adrenals, sex hormones, or probably a little bit of all of those. Um, so for, first, it's recognizing that this is not going to be, you know, here's month one, and by month two, you will have lost all the weight. It does just doesn't work that way. I mean, let's be honest. Women, you know, our hormones govern so much of what goes on with um, our bodies that it just it's not a fast thing. I mean, you'll you'll I'll, I'll hear from clients. Well, my husband's been eating the same way I have for six months, and he's lost twenty pounds, and I've lost two. Like, well, it speaks to hormones. It's not that you're any less disciplined. It's not that you're any less committed to these changes. It just goes to show you that it's not just about calories in, calories out. It just doesn't, that's not what it is. And that's, that's, that's a very different mindset from where my training is. Um, but to touch on it based on, on your other question, you know, just the fact that, um, you know, people are having all these cravings. I would say, you know, the other piece is you really have to figure out like, why are you having cravings? Cravings are a reflection of what your body's not inherently getting, whether it's a mineral, whether it's a, a macronutrient like fat, you know, there are plenty of people who still are, are paranoid about eating fat. And I, I comfortably use the word paranoid because I do have some clients who are like that too. And we have to kind of coax them through this whole process. But if you're not eating enough fats, you're not going to keep your blood sugar stable. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, you know, I have some clients who have a very specific snack before bed because we know that these macronutrients, a little bit of um, fruit sugar, a little bit of protein, a little bit of healthy fats and some minerals will make a huge difference in how they can maintain their blood sugar overnight so we can get things squared away with their adrenal glands. So I think that there's there's multiple things that need to come have to come into play that impact um, weight gain. And it's really doing the, the digging. Anyone that tries to tell a woman um uh, any woman that they can have them lose drop 20 30 pounds in a short amount of time is lying um, there's no way to effectively do that without putting the work in and, and when i say work work on both the part of the person you're working with so they really dig for the root cause of why that weight gain and inflammation has started but also recognizing it's again it's i go back to that same analogy it is a journey not a race and anyone that's you know is suggesting to clients that this is going to be a really really fast process is doing them a disservice Truly. Yeah. And just to speak a little bit more on that, the programs that help you drop 20 pounds in a short amount of time, that's going to cause more endocrine disruption in the long run than mm -hmm. it will help you to keep that weight off for a long period of time. So, right. Right. And, and, you know, like I'd mentioned earlier, there are big bloggers who are, you know, making a killing, you know, they've got seven figure businesses. And I see a lot of their clients because they start off losing weight and then all of a sudden they start gaining weight. And it's because their adrenals and their thyroid have gotten so disrupted by the, um, you know, kind of rigid rigidity of their exercise programs and the rigidity of their eating patterns that their bodies just kind of said, all right, time out. Um, we need to kind of we need to kind of go back to where we were before and, and start this all over again. This is not working. So, you know, those kind of rigid programs can do a further disruption. And I think in many ways, a lot of these programs prey on women. Um, and again, not at a certain age, but just women in general, convincing them that you can lose all this weight really effectively. You just need to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it doesn't always work that way. So I'm curious how you have that conversation uh, with women not to lose weight so quickly because we're so trained to have things done instantly or very yes. fast. Yes. So how do you tell them, no, we want to slow that down and do it a lot slower? Yeah. And it's hard because I, I have a couple of clients that I've worked with for two years for different reasons. It's not primarily for that. And what they, what they come to me for is they're frustrated with weight gain. So that's their pain point. But what it really represents, and I just keep reminding them, I'm like, okay, this is a journey. This is not a race. Um, you know, just because you're not losing weight quickly doesn't mean what we're doing isn't effective. Doesn't mean what we're doesn't mean that what we're doing is not helping you. We just need to figure out what that piece is that's contributing to why this is occurring. And I think that it goes back to that same piece, like I mentioned, that internal dialogue that we're having with ourselves. You know, for some people, they'll come to me and they'll say, "I've never had a weight problem before. I'm 45 years old. I've never had a weight problem before." That almost almost sometimes is worse than maybe someone who's had to struggle their whole life with maintaining a certain weight, as opposed to someone who's maybe had it a little bit easier than their peers. 
uh, because I keep saying, well, all the things I used to do don't work anymore. And so, you know, kind of wrapping your head around the fact that some of this is beyond your control, but also acknowledging that, you know, that the limiting beliefs that I hear a lot of women say and men say, well, I'm X age. So because I'm this age, I just have to accept this. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like, I just don't buy into that at all. So um, I think it just, it kind of goes back to, you know, opening up the dialogue to explain that I understand this is frustrating, you know, really relating to your client and explaining to them that you hear them, you understand it's frustrating for them, that they need to weather the course um, and, and just continue to kind of move forward and, and trust the process. I mean, really, I use the term surrender, but even the person I'm working with, I told her when we started working together, I was like, I'm not going to micromanage you. I am not going to second guess your decisions. I trust you and I trust the process and I surrender because what I'm trying to do isn't working. So clearly if I'm not figuring it out with all my background, I need someone else to come in and objectively look at it a little differently. And so I, I, I oftentimes will explain my own, uh, you know, in a very brief fashion, kind of address my own experiences so that it makes it much more relatable. Right. So uh Actually, since we're talking about that, um, we have a couple questions left here. If you have a morning routine that helps you to prepare your body's overall wellness each day, then what is it? I love this. Okay. So 2018, I decided I was going to get really serious about doing mindset work and it has made all the difference. I have had exponential growth in my business and a lot of, you know, personal and professional success, however you define that. And so I start my day with a gratitude journal. So I write down three things I'm grateful for. And it's usually like silly, what people might perceive are silly, but like silly things. Um, I do mindfulness exercises every day. And then I spend 30 minutes doing some form of professional development. And that could be like right now, my, um, my private Facebook group, it, we're doing a book club this summer. And so we've been reading some books, but I'm oftentimes reading books for professional development for myself because the better I am mindset wise, the better I am to everyone that I serve. And then I exercise. So those are the things I do and that work really well for me. And I oftentimes will suggest them to clients because I've just come to find that I start my day off on a much better foot when I'm taking care of me first. So that oftentimes means I'm up really early. Like my husband and my kids think I'm crazy, but I'm totally fine going to bed earlier and getting up earlier. Cause if I get an hour, an hour and a half to myself, I just feel like I'm much better prepared to deal with the world. Um, and to be able to, you know, give to my family, give to my clients, you know, give to our friends and family. Yeah, everyone benefits from you feeling well. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and final question here. What are your three favorite foods to reduce food cravings and improve energy? Ooh, it's healthy fats, healthy fats, healthy fats. Um, right now, I would say I'm really like loving cashews. So cashews, so like a, a nut um, is a great way to do it. Um, sadly, I love avocados, but they're on my elimination diet, um, but avocados are generally my go-to. And then, you know, the other thing that I've come to really love, again, goes back to like a healthy fat. It's a dairy substitute. There is a coconut based yogurt. My husband's going to laugh if he hears me say this called coconut collective. It's based in the UK. I know they just have some stores on the East coast that carry it. Total game changer. Lots of healthy fats, tastes good, and it's not full of a bunch of junk. And it is as light and fluffy as like whipped cream. Just amazing. Um, I'll have that with like some berries and maybe some seeds and a little bit of stevia. And so I always say three favorite foods to reduce cravings, healthy fats, healthy fats, healthy fats, because they're going to keep your blood sugar stable. They're going to keep you energized and you're not going to be searching for junk. Like even when clients crave anything, I always say just have a small scoop of almond butter or, you know, this is the time to pull out if you have dairy, if you eat dairy, like a piece of raw cheese or some wild brine olives, you know, something that is going to keep your blood sugar stable. Those are oftentimes better things to go to. So great for your hormones, great for sleep, great for energy, great for food cravings, all of the above. Awesome, Cynthia. Well, I know that you have a promo coming up. You have the Holistic Blueprint that is going to be relaunching in October yeah. of 2018. Can you talk a little bit about that program? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, this is the irony, you know, life imitates art, but I started seeing consistencies with my female clients. And so I designed Holistic Blueprint to really speak to the pain points that women are dealing with. And so it's a six week virtual program. Um, it's designed to address um, sleep and energy issues. 
It addresses food cravings and it also touches on strategies for uh, weight gain. And so we touch on intermittent fasting. We talk about carb cycling. Um, they get six weeks worth of menus and each week is a different focus. It's done in a private Facebook group and I actually have a, um, I have a new website up, but there'll be a whole page where all of the information will reside. And so when I relaunch it in October, it's going to have a regular enrollment and then a VIP um, option, which will people will get a, a little bit more hands on with me. So I'm super, super excited. We're spending a lot of time this summer reworking the entire program. My VAs um, are amazing. And so we're writing lots of like new content, fleshing things out. And I'm so, so excited because I think it's a really great and accessible way for people to work with me, but do it in a group format. And I'll have the links to uh, those pages on my website at uh, summitforwellness.com slash 51, which will be where the show notes for this episode are. Uh, you have your website, chtwellness.com. Um, and what are some of your social media channels? So I am on um, probably most active on Instagram right now, but www.instagram.com. Um, you know, it's CHT underscore wellness. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook, but CHT wellness is all together. Um, but definitely active on all those platforms and would definitely love to see some of your, your listeners. Awesome. And I hope they go check all that out because you have brought a ton of great information about the endocrine system. So thank you so much for coming on and taking the time to talk with me about some of the stuff that you're working on over there and different ways that women can help their hormones and to be able to try and balance things back out so that they can reach those weight goals that they have and get their energy back. Awesome. No, thank you so much for having me, Brian. Well, there you go. If you are a woman and you have some hormone problems going on right now, then I highly recommend you go to chtwellness.com to learn from Cynthia about ways to improve your hormones so that you can get your energy back and if you have any kind of weight gain issues, be able to rebalance your weight back to where it should be. Like I said, she is an absolute wealth of knowledge, and I had a great time talking with Cynthia, so thank you so much, Cynthia, for coming on to the show. Uh, I also highly recommend you swing by her Facebook page and just let her know that you heard uh, her speak on our podcast and just say thank you for coming on and providing so much information to all of us. Okay, we continue the conversations in our private Facebook group. If you go to summitforwellness.com slash tribe, you can go straight to the group and ask to join. We will bring you in and you can learn a lot more because we like to dive deeper into uh, the topics that we have on our podcast. If you liked this episode, then please go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Those ratings and reviews do make a difference and helps to get us out in front in front of more people. So if you go to summitforwellness.com slash iTunes, it takes about five seconds. You can really help us out to uh, expand our outreach with this podcast. Keep climbing to the peak of your health, and we will see you next time.